Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about strep throat. Strep throat is a very common condition. It's caused by a bacterial infection, a group A streptococcus called strep pyogenes. There are different kinds of strep, different than the kind that typically infects the lung. It's a bacteria that grows in the back of the throat or on the tonsils. It causes acute pharyngitis. Most causes of acute pharyngitis are viral. They're not bacterial, even in children where the peak incidence of strep throat occurs, only 20 to 30 percent of the cases of pharyngitis are due to strep. And in adults, that falls to about 5 to 10 percent. Now, it's estimated that about 15 million office visits are going to occur because of strep throat in the United States. There's no vaccine available, no specific form of immunity. So if you have one infection, you're likely to get another infection far as the strep throat's concerned, can be considered an occupational disease of children. The World Health Organization says that there are going to be at least 600 million cases this year in the, United, in, in the world, 100 million or slightly more cases of impetigo. In the old days here in the United States, we used to have a complication called acute rheumatic fever still in the world, about 500,000 cases, and rheumatic heart disease going to strike 200,000 people, but not kill them. It's going to linger on so that a total of about 16 million people in the world have rheumatic heart disease. You can get multiple infections over a period of time. It's estimated that a single individual is going to have at least three infections by the time they get to age 13. In one reported case, a person over a period of four years had 11 infections. The, Strep throat tends to occur mostly in the wintertime and in the spring from November to May. But even during these months, viral causes are much more common than bacterial causes. In the summertime, the group A strep tends to cause impetigo, especially in children between the ages of two and five. The strep easily spreads from person to person through coughs and sneezes. It's present as what we call a small respiratory droplet condition where the respiratory droplets from your sneeze or from your cough or even from talking can linger in the air. Now, not all people who are infected have symptoms. A person could be a carrier. The transmission is person to person. You don't get it from pets. Basically, you don't get it from improperly handled food. It's from saliva or nasal secretions. You breathe in the droplets or you touch an area where somebody is where the droplets have been and then you touch your mouth or you touch your nose. It can live for a very short period of time on a doorknob or a water faucet. Those are relatively unlikely. If we have somebody in the household who has strep, your likelihood of catching it's about 25%. That's the contagious rate. If we look at daycare centers, it's up to about 33, 34%. Person can be an asymptomatic carrier, as I mentioned, but those people who are asymptomatic carriers don't seem to be very good sources for spreading the bacteria. While we said that in a household, the contagion rate might be as high as 25%, if a person's a carrier, it could be only 3 or 4 or 5%. Well, close physical contact seems to be required for the bacteria to spread. So it's often in a household where children are more susceptible than adults. Children less than age three don't seem to get the bacterial infection very often. If we're talking about adults, the adults typically are exposed either because they have children or they work with children. Well, the highest incidences are in areas where children congregate, in schools and daycare facilities, and also where people are kept in close quarters, for instance, in military training facilities. Well, the incubation period is about two to five days. The illness lasts for about seven to ten days. Sometimes the, with treatment, the symptoms can be decreased by only about a day. The symptoms overlap with the same kind of symptoms you get with a viral pharyngitis. Typically, it's a mild infection, but it can be very painful. The sore throat starts quite quickly. It's often abrupt. 
it can sometimes be worse on one side. You can have pain while swallowing, something we call odynophagia. If it starts off just in the back of the throat and then seems to move to one side, it might be because you have a complication. The fever typically is more than 100, 101. It's unlikely to have no fever associated with it. The symptoms have to do with red, sore, swollen tonsils, maybe with some patches of white or some streaks of pus. You have tiny red spots sometimes on the hard or soft palate. The tongue can be enlarged and reddened and bright. Looks sort of like a strawberry. We call it a strawberry tongue. Sometimes associated with swollen lymph nodes in the front portion of the neck. And sometimes a scarlatiniform rash, a nonspecific red rash that spreads throughout the body. Sometimes it's associated with other kinds of symptoms like a headache or nausea or vomiting or abdominal pain. But typically not repeat, typically not with the symptoms associated with a virus. So you don't have a cold, you don't have a runny nose or a stuffy nose, you don't have hoarseness, there are no sores in your mouth or conjunctivitis, all of those are symptoms suggestive of a bacterial, I'm sorry, a viral infection. When we look inside the mouth, we find that the tonsils are red, they're swollen, the thing that hangs down in the back part of the mouth we call the uvula, that oftentimes is red and swollen and beefy. Sometimes there are blood spots on the top of the palate. We have those enlarged lymph nodes and sometimes we get that rash that we call the scarlatiniform rash. The Symptoms are different in children who are less than age three. They typically don't become infected, but if they do, they tend to have a low-grade fever, maybe show signs of irritability or loss of appetite. Sometimes they actually have a runny nose, sometimes with some pus. They have oftentimes excoriated nostrils from scratching. They have diffusely swollen nodes, not just nodes in the front part of the neck. They have an exudative pharyngitis only occasionally. That's much more common in children between the ages of 5 and 15. Well, if we look at the rash, the scarlatiniform rash, first you tend to develop the pharyngitis, then a couple days later you develop a sandpaper-like red or blotchy skin rash that often begins on the neck and spreads to the trunk and then to the limbs. It seems to be more prominent in the areas of the folds. So around the groin, around the axilla, in the area of the front portion of the elbow, you have these linear lines, we call them pastias lines. It's not on the palms and soles, it's not around the mouth. Actually around the mouth it seems to be a little bit white. The cheeks can be somewhat flush, the tongue, remember we have that strawberry, the reddish tongue. And, and sometimes while the rash comes after the sore throat, Sometimes it could come before the sore throat. Generally, everything fades out in about a week, and for several days or even weeks after, then you have some peeling, peeling involving the fingertips and the toes and the groin. Sometimes you can get a complication of the streptococcal sore throat. Sometimes you could get rheumatic fever, kidney disease, we call it post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, or sometimes people get pneumonia. Occasionally there's the middle ear infection or an abscess on the tonsil or sometimes people become septic, actually you get the bacteria inside the system, inside the blood. That's pretty uncommon. There's mastoiditis, meningitis, all of those more frequent in the older times, not now and probably not because of our therapy but because it seems we're just a healthier population. Rarely osteoarthritis or osteomyelitis rather or arthritis, sometimes impetigo or erysipelas or cellulitis. And the complications, sometimes it might elicit psoriasis. Strep infections may, if you have an underlying tendency to psoriasis, cause psoriasis to flare. There's rheumatic fever, rheumatic fever associated with carditis, inflammation of the heart, or arthritis, or a movement disorder we call Sydenham's chorea, or subcutaneous nodules, or a peculiar red spreading rash on the skin. But interestingly, there's a condition known as PANDAS, and PANDAS stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Streptococcal Infection, where the strep seems to, in pre-pubertal children 
be associated with the development of anorexia nervosa, obsessive compulsive disorder, and some psychiatric abnormalities. Very peculiar condition. Now, this is not the same as strep pneumonia. When a person gets pneumonia, that's a different kind of bacteria. The strep pyogenase is a gram positive cocci, a little round thing that looks sort of like a yeast. It grows in a chain and it causes a certain kind of hemolysis. We call it a beta hemolysis when it grows in the agar plate. There are more than 200 subtypes that are known. And some of the subtypes can cause specific problems. Well, what are the signs suggestive of a virus infection? Suggestive of a virus infection, not something that should take you to the doctor, not something for which you would need an antibiotic. If you have a cough, a runny nose, hoarseness, or you have conjunctivitis, you get some diarrhea, you have a viral looking rash, or you have no fever, then chances are you don't have strep throat causes a sore throat are legion. Lots of different kinds of viruses. We have the adenovirus, the rhinovirus, the respiratory syncytial virus, the echovirus, the oxaki virus, the influenza virus. We can have the Epstein-Barr virus, the mononucleosis kind of virus, the para-influenza virus, the cytomegalovirus, and then we have some bacteria-like organisms like chlamydia and mycoplasma, and we can develop herpangina or hand, foot, and mouth disease. All of these are causes, potential causes, of sore throat. And then we have some non-infectious causes. So maybe you have a sore throat because you're smoking cigarettes or you have hay fever or you're in an area where there's a lot of chemical pollution, air pollution. You have dry air, you have heartburn, you have some of the acid that gets in the back of the throat. Well, by physical examination, when you go to see the doctor, if you do go, the doctor can't tell the difference between a viral infection and a bacterial infection just by look. But fortunately, we have some very rapid tests. We have a 10-minute strep test, a rapid strep test, that can tell whether you have the infection or not. But there's a problem. And the problem is some people can be carriers. So a carrier is more likely to have a viral infection than to have the strep, especially if we're talking about adult population. So there's some judgment that's going to be necessary. So a culture, a culture doesn't necessarily provide evidence that your sore throat is due to strep because you might be, as I say, a carrier. The treatment, if you have a strep infection, is symptomatic relief. You could take aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory disease a, a drug. You tend not to want aspirin itself, but one of the non-steroidals like ibuprofen or naproxen, much better, sometimes acetaminophen. There are lozenges that you can suck on, you can do, uh, you can use some gargle with some warm salt water, you can drink tea, you can chew gum, you can use topical anesthetic sprayed in the back of the mouth, maybe some lidocaine or some Benadryl. You could perhaps consider some sort of antibiotic. Now, unfortunately, at the present time, about 70% of the people who go and see primary care physicians with sore throat are going to be given an antibiotic. But only about 5% or 10% at most have group A strep. Well, even without antibiotic therapy, you're going to get better. The fever is going to go away in about three to five days. The pain is going to go away in about a week. And the antibiotics are probably going to do relatively little. In fact, it's found that antibiotic therapy shortens the duration of the illness by only about 16 hours. Decreases the symptoms, decreases the time that you're sick, maybe decreases the likelihood of your spreading the bacteria. But it's important to realize that in Europe, they recommend no treatment. If you do opt for a treatment, you want a narrow antibiotic. Narrow antibiotic, something like penicillin or amoxicillin. That would be quite sufficient. And if you happen to be allergic to penicillin, well, maybe some cephalexin or some clindamycin, they would probably be okay. Tetracyclines don't work. Sulfa doesn't seem to work. Cipro and Levaquin don't seem to work very well.
And the question is, what is the benefit of treatment? Well, certainly we can decrease the incidence of acute rheumatic fever and we can decrease some of the other complications, but those are pretty rare when we consider all of the infections and we consider our particular country and our healthcare system and how well off we are and how our immunity seems to be. Well, the treatment only can decrease the contagiousness. It does that relatively quickly. So the family is less likely to become infected, classmates less likely to become infected. You can get back to school a little bit more quickly perhaps. But for the overwhelming majority of cases, there's going to be spontaneous resolution without any kind of therapy. Well, how about if a child in the household has a strep infection, should you, living in the household, get some antibiotics? And the answer is that at the present time, no. How about if you have recurrent sore throats, recurrent streptococcal thro sore throats documented, then should you get a tonsillectomy? Well, if you have more than three infections every year, the benefits are small, and we know over a period of time, the likelihood of repeat infections is going to decrease. And oftentimes, we're treating people who have viral infections who happen to be carriers. So that doesn't seem to make any sense. How do you prevent the infection in the first place? Well, wash your hands, wash your hands often. When you wash your hands, appropriate hand washing requires at least 20 seconds. And you see so many people using those gels and rubbing them on their hands because they supposedly are going to kill the bacteria. Those things don't work very well. You should only use them if there's not any runny water around. You should cover your mouth, cover your nose when you sneeze or when you cough. You should use a tissue instead of a handkerchief. You should cough into the sleeve or into the elbow area if no tissue is available. And if you're infected, well, obviously, if you have a fever, stay home. Stay home from school or daycare until the fever goes away or till you've been taking the antibiotics for at least 24 hours. Then you're non-infectious anymore. Anyway, so now you know the story about strep and strep throat. If you have any questions, let us know. Remember, most people don't need antibiotics. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thank you.